Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Paul Pangaro. If you don't know me, I'm president of the American Society of Cybernetics. Actually, it's the American Society for Cybernetics. Yes, it is. Uh, thanks for joining. This is the sixth in the series called Cybernetics and Humans Knowing. It's a continuing cadence of events uh, to highlight the ideas and participants uh, in the global cybernetic community. Today, as you know, the conversation concerns the work of Francisco Varela, major force of cybernetics. Uh, I'm sure most of you know him, and if not, this is a wonderful place to start. His work spans cybernetics and philosophy and cognitive science, biology. He was a major presence, I'm thrilled to say, at the ASC in 1984, and many of us here in this call met him then, and we'll always remember that. And also he came to the Gordon Research Conference in cybernetics in the same year. He died in 2001 at the age of 54, but his influence remains very deep and ongoing. As you know, uh, we recently mourned the death of Umberto Maturana, and this for me makes today's conversation particularly poignant. Um, Thank you. Maturana died on May 6th, as you know, and the reason why this is relevant is uh, Varela and Maturana worked together for many years. Varela had been Maturana's student and then his colleague, and then famously, we might say their interests diverged, as they often do between former mentors and students. But their collaborations were critical to the development of their shared work, as well as their individual contributions and to the field as a whole. With that, let me introduce Jude Lombardi, a trustee of the ASC, a major catalyst in this whole event series and designer of this session. Jude. Thank you, Paul. And welcome everyone. Thanks for being here on this Sunday afternoon or evening. I was provoked by the January interview with Paul Pangaro and Patricia Clough about the biological computer lab to do an interview about Francisco Varela. Little did I know I was opening a Pandora paradoxical box about all sorts of phenomena, some of which Paul made reference, the fields Paul made reference to. He was very prolific on many topics in many fields of science, philosophy, phenomenology, to mention a few. One can only imagine what he would have done if he might have gone on. At the January session, Bruno Clark was in the audience and something he said, I didn't remember, but then I did. What he said was something in the chat about Donna Haraway never got second order cybernetics. And that triggered for me, wanting to know more about what he thought about cybernetics and Varela in particular. It was soon after that, that several others declared an interest in participating in this event about Varela and his work, no wonder. So what we will do today is Patricia, Bruna, and I will converse for 40-ish minutes about Borella's cybernetics, and in particular, the notions of self-organization, self-referential systems, and self-reference. Hopefully this will generate a baseline for the last 50 minutes of this session for open participation and discussion about this particular set of concepts and how, we might, how they might establish a premise for us to deal with big data and the technologies that are a component of it. I came to the term big data because I don't know if you remember a Tennessee Williams play and I can't remember the name, but it, in the movie it starred Paul Newman and Elizabeth Taylor and there was a big daddy. Tin on the roof, represented... roof on the tin, tin roof. Cat on, on a hot tin roof. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's the one. And so that's how I got the big data. It was I was reading this information or data, if you will, and it triggered for me the term big data and all that might entail as I became to think of it differently after reading Clough's paper. So please prepare your comments and questions and post them in the chat under the heading comment or question. And Larry Richards, I think, and I will monitor them as we continue our turning together during the second half of this event. So here we go. In the beginning, the BCL. 
And I guess, Patricia, you're probably the person that knew Varela earlier or earliest. For several decades, beginning in the late 1960s, Heinz von Forster created a place, a milieu, if you will, called the Biological Computer Lab, often referred to as the BCL, located at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Champaign. He invited a variety of scientists, artists, mathematicians, philosophers, and students to explore a field of study known as cybernetics. A central theme at the BCL was the notions and theories associated with the concept self organization, which I think was just beginning to emerge as a language. A regular visit to the, Varela was a regular visitor at the BCL where Patricia Clough at the time was a student and came to know Francisco Varela. Patricia, you mentioned in our previous interview that while you were a student at the BCL, that you literally watched Humberto Maturana draw his emerging explanation of autopoiesis and the biology of cognition on the chalkboard. <laughs> yes. I say chalkboard intentionally. How did this experience relate to your interactions with Varela? So um, to start off, I, I did not ever meet Francisco Varela. Ah, okay. Uh, I have learned in preparing for today, reading uh, a few of Bruno's essays and Varela's essays, that uh, he was not in Champaign Urbana in the years I was there, which was 71 to 76. And I arrived um, having been a community organizer in Brooklyn and introduced to BCL by Ivan Illich. I've been having such a week and more since we decided to do this, reconnecting my whole life. Because I, of course, knew that Illich had sent me to BCL, but I hadn't realized the role he had played and what his relationship was um, uh, to actually to Heinz. Because when I arrived at BCL in my 20s, Truly, I realize now that the feeling that this notion of autopoiesis was being invented right in front of my eyes was that it really was being invented <laughs> right in front of my eyes. I thought it was my experience in a sense that, oh my God, what is that? And, but there it was. It was, it was Chicho who I met often in, in, at BCL. In, in those years, Matt Tarana, sorry. Um, I have one... Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing thing to understand how much was happening to get something published and how often it had been rejected by public, for publication, Biology of Cognition or one of them or the piece on autopoiesis. And my sense that I learned autopoiesis not by reading about it has always made mm. me think I need to read this because I learned it from someone who was doing it right on the blackboard. And I'll let go of my moment by telling a great story that I want to return to. Maturana was doing autopoiesis on the blackboard. And I said, I don't know. I love that I said this because I don't know where it came from. Are you saying there's no reality? <laughs> he laughed. His yeah. eyes did that twinkly Maturana eye thing. And he walked over to the wooden desk I was sitting in, in some classroom, which still amazes me. And he kicked the leg of the desk and said, uh-huh, uh-huh. Meaning, of course, there's a reality. I want to return to that because that story has remained with me. Needless to say, his foot was, and the kicking was what we might call an indication of a boundary and the making of a reality. Um, the thought of autopoiesis, of course, and self-reference was amazing to me because I was also getting a PhD at the U of I in sociology that was completely devoted to a kind of science that meant positivism, representation, and reality. Social science 
And I had just begun to experience that in the field of biology, in neurobiology, in molecular biology, none of that held anymore. Never mind what I would learn about physics eventually and mathematics. So uh, as I've said many times to my own students, my head was sort of like schizo. There was something I was learning in sociology that seemed totally out of date mm -hmm. with something I thought everybody knew about because I hadn't really taken in how new the concept was and how revolutionary, but I went with it. And um, I still go with it. <laughs> so that's where I'll stop for now before we get Thank into you. definitions. You helped me with a distinction in your conversation between realism and reality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like your experience at the BCL was a very asynchronistic one where there were conflicting and, and out of sync ideas, which could be an incredible time to Mm -hmm. emerge differently. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, um, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I've said before, I think last time, that I knew that they, the revolution was from something, but I didn't know what it was from exactly. And so I took in everything I learned with a very open mind and heart um, because of the people and the way we were learning together, mm -hmm. but also because somehow you know, in 1971, coming from New York, it all sounded right to me. Fantastic, thank you. So Bruno, yeah. how did you get interested in cybernetics and particularly <laughs> the work of Perella? Wow, um, I came along by a, a sort of a, I mean, I'm an English professor who got into literature and science. Right. And cool. and then was reading critical theory. I mean, kind of the, you know, it's a, a theory head in the humanities academy. And the work of Catherine Hales is probably uh, uh, one of the important vehicles of just learning that there was this thing uh, called autopoiesis. This would be in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and then her, um, uh, so she had some writing on, Matron and Varela and, and on Heinz von Furster. And through an odd, uh, I've actually, if you've seen, I have a little paper in, in Jocelyn Chapman's uh, For the Love of Cybernetics, it tells this story. Hmm. So I'll just, I'll abbreviate it. Um, but I, uh, 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 Heinz, uh, I had an opportunity to meet Heinz and that was in 2001, very shortly before he died. And the interview, the redacted interview I did with Heinz there is published in uh, Emergence and Embodiment, which I co-edited with Mark Hansen in 2009. So, um, so at the same time, I'd been introduced to Luhmann uh, and mm -hmm. I was avidly reading Luhmann. And, but as I was doing so, I saw that he was constantly footnoting Heinz von Furster and he was constantly using laws of form uh, to, uh, to, to kind of parse the way that he was doing systems theory. So, so I was on these dual tracks and for a while Varela was just the other half of Maturana as the inventor of autopoiesis. So uh, to, I think of myself as some extent, I kind of stumbled into being a historian of this particular moment in, of this particular radical uh, uh, moment in 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 science that was centered at the BCL. So but it took me a long time to wrap my head around Varela and and to then <laughs> gradually get a sense for his his own unique thing. Uh, and to some extent that was mediated by and if people have had a chance or, or do have a chance to look at the slideshow I put up, uh, what I, I just go very quickly through <laughs> the many times that Francisco was uh, publicized in the Coevolution Quarterly. Uh, and, and so he has an interview there uh, that published in 76 that for me, that I've read many, I just think it's incredibly brilliant. He, he doesn't even mention autopoiesis because no, he's trying to keep it non-technical. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but he talks a lot about autonomy and self-reference and closure. Right. And, and, and so I've always thought of that as in this one document, you've kind of got second order cybernetics in a brilliant nutshell. Uh, and, and you're so, talking about the Johnson interview? Is that the one you're pointing yeah, at? Yeah, the Barbara Johnson interview it's called great. Unobserving Natural Systems. It's beautiful. Yes. But if I, I could just, um, uh, so as a historian, uh, uh, in Coevolution Quarterly, Stuart Brand misstated that Varela was working at the BCL. And I think that's where the myth went. Whereas in fact, he was visiting while he was doing his yes. doctorate at Harvard in the later 60s. And so that's why Patricia wouldn't have met him there because he, was, he had gone back to Chile around 1970 exactly. uh, uh, before having to go into exile. He so. just had left. I just want to join because I think it's Please. probably interesting, although maybe a little esoteric, I don't know. So I then, left BCL in 76. And although I remained friends with Ivan Illich until his death and did meet up with Heinz again in the crowd in 86, I came back to cybernetics just like Bruce through literary studies, through post-structuralism uh, where I hadn't expected to see it again. And then of course I was found myself um, Actually, I was in India giving a talk on film, which I was teaching, when suddenly I put my thoughts about film and realized it had gone, that I still was influenced by BCL without thinking about it. And then shortly after I read Catherine Hales's book, because by then I was interested in the critical studies of science and technology. And so when I saw all of that work there, I thought, oh my God, you know, it's still alive. And in fact, you know, I don't think people uh, in the larger academia besides, I don't know what besides, but certainly not sociology or cultural studies uh, at first took up cybernetics, um, autopoiesis, the organism, I think until science studies and critical science studies sort of gave it a life. And so it's interesting that autopoiesis had such, um, as Varela says in one of his own essays, has a life outside of its beginning and found its way sometimes rightly or you know, correctly or incorrectly, whatever that would mean, but found its way other places. Um, and so important, I think even today to think through what it means uh, to say something is closed or what closure is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. I, and I think for me, autopoiesis standing alone is to perform an act of reductionism because it does not reflect the entirety of the organism in the sense of always living in a medium by mm -hmm. its terminology, you know. But if you go into understanding and the reading, you begin to see there is a connection between the organizationally closed. Uh, organism and its medium, which is always the case if it's living. But that's, that's the, one of the anti-communicative parts, I think, of that uh, theory, quite frankly. I just want to read one little thing right now. My cybernetic starting point here is the distinction between explanations and experience. And it's one that Barella speaks to as well. One is based on the logics including time, that we bring forth our doing, doing is knowing, in language about a world and experience in our doing in zero time. This is experience. Explanation of our experience entails uncertainty. We can never know it all, be it properties, operations, structures, dynamics, or organization itself. However, we cannot let this uncertainty stop our quest for exploration, only reflect it. So with that in mind, I want us to realize that today we're talking about explanations for three terms in general, and that uh, that doesn't explain the experience itself. That is a 
domain that is related to the dynamics, which once you explain it becomes an explanation, not an experience. So let's play a game. You ready? Okay. You have, I'm gonna say 13 minutes to tell what you think self-organization uh, means and what the salient features of the concept of self-organization are to you. Who wants to start? Let Bruno start. <laughs> okay. All right, happy to start. Now that was self-organization, self, self-reference self and autopoiesis. The three terms, thank you very much. Okay. What we're gonna, can I say something real quick, Bruno, to set the pace yeah. or context? Sure. Um, I didn't read that first sentence, which is really what we're gonna do is talk about Varela's work and take it to these three concepts, self-organization, self, Reference. Referential. No, referential. And then self-reference. Are they similar? Are they the same? How do they differ will be where we'll go. Okay. Okay. Uh, in 1961, von Furster wrote a paper called On Self-Organizing Systems and Their Environments. Uh, I actually, in that same book I mentioned, Emergence and Embodiment, have a, a, a chapter on that paper. So self-organization was the a leading cybernetic concept uh, uh, coming out of the first cybernetics. And Heinz was all over it uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a, uh, a category of system that seemed to be anti-entropic uh, uh, because self-organization, if it's adding uh, complexity, uh, then, then it's lowering its entropy. So those were the terms. So that term kind of floats around uh, somewhat unmoored. Uh, and, and so in my own work, I've, I've tried to be, and I think it's correct that, that ultimately self-organization has to do with uh, what can happen to structures. Uh, that 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 a system can uh, uh, will self-organize, and this would be a rearrangement or an anti-entropic uh, or complexifying uh, rearrangement of its structures. Okay, self-organization. Uh, but now you need self-referential uh, is the adjective or is the qualifier then for a certain kind of system. Uh, so, and, and of course, autopoietic systems are the fundamental mode of a self-referential system uh, coming out of the theory of Maturana and Varela because it is, uh, 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 because it's self-producing uh, and, and, and therefore it's, it's output in other, and so we don't think of it in terms of input and output, which is sort of the linearity of classical cybernetic design systems thinking, but rather in terms of a uh, 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 the kind of system whose product is itself. All right, so it's its own output, <laughs> um, uh, not closed for interactions, as Varela uh, and and all sort of good. Uh, second order cyberneticists are, are quick Good. to quick to explain, right? <laughs> because the environment is there. So I would just say, Jude, that autopoiesis names a certain kind of system operation for it's sort of the operation of a self-referential system at the biological level. And so the environment is entailed in the concept, but the environment doesn't operate autopoietically. It's 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 a background of uh, of uh, you know with its own complexity, but 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 its operationality is is, is undetermined. Uh, generally speaking, what operates is the autopoietic system. Now, self-reference. The tricky thing here is that in the classical tradition of Western philosophy, self-reference is a uh, uh, it's a propositional 
it's a logical category within a logic of propositions. And that's, and so Epimenides the Cretan says, all Cretans are liars, but when he makes that proposition, he's referring, he's referring to himself because he's also a Cretan, all right? So now you can't trust the, uh, what he says <laughs> because, and so you get the, this is the classical antinomy that is produced by self-referential propositions. However, self-reference with regard to systems is not propos, I mean, we're in a completely different domain now from the domains of propositional logic. We're in the domains of material dynamical operation of system okay. elements. Uh, and, and, and certain kinds of systems have this self-enclosing, this operational closure by which they sort of cut themselves out of their environment uh, uh, to maintain their self-production, uh, but always in terms of the affordances of the environment which you know, which may or may not be such that they allow the system to continue its autopoiesis. Uh, okay. Did you in, did you intentionally feel the need to talk about all those things in relation to one another? Well, I thought I was asked to. <laughs> no, the, the intention was to ask what you thought about self-organization and explore that as a concept that could stand alone for explaining the autopoiesis no, molecular but, but it can't because dynamic. Can't. organization is. Well, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Well, that yeah. would be my, that'd be, that's why I moved on. Right. Well, I think it, I think it can in an explanation form, but you know, because there are certain things that when I think about all uh, self-organization, certain like closure, like operation, like structural dynamics, uh, perturbations, those sorts of things are, are relevant to the wholeness to the, you know, and of course who draws the line of where the wholeness is becomes the fundamental uh, self-reference sort of part of it, but thanks anyway. <laughs> well, let me, let me give you a little bit of what you want, uh, right. because I'm going to say everything that, that Bruno just said, because there's only one truth here. <laughs> I'm joking. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm joking, but I'm going to say oh, it God. in a way that leads to rethinking autopoiesis or maybe a right. critical view of it. So what I understand about autopoiesis, given your terms, uh, Jude, was that it has an operational closure. That means for me, every interaction of the organism with the environment, and it does interact with the environment, correct, decomplexifies or trivializes the environment. And you notice Bruce sort of, sort of playing around a little bit about where the environment is. What that means is that the, and, and this is amazing, the organism selects from the environment in such a way that a perturbations from the environment can be compensated for such that homeostasis is restored and the functioning of the system self-producing quality or capacity is maintained. If it doesn't, it dies. There it's you go. boundaries. I, the boundaries never change in a sense that there's, it's always boundary. You can't separate the closure from the self-reflection because the self-reference, I'm sorry, not reflection, self-reflection <laughs> uh, requires that every interaction returns to the maintenance of the organism or its closure. So they belong together. I love what Bruce said about we're in a different reference and logic here. We're in living, actually. That's right. why you raised the question of experience. Now, the notion of self-reference went in two ways for me, and I think that's important. One, towards, as I implied already, a somewhat smart organism, a biology of cognition worth knowing about as a sociologist. That's what I mentioned earlier. I thought, oh my God, you know, the body does things. The organism, I want to be clear, it's not the body. The organism is alive and dynamic, not you know a biology we want to get rid of or even construct discursively its meaning, but that it's involved in the base. It's part of cognition. You know, it, uh, embodied mind wouldn't be published till seventy seven. I'd read it in New York after I was out of BCL, and of course it's 
very rich in this way. So a smart uh, organism, let's say, uh, a, bi <laughs> a biology of cognition worth knowing about. And it was interesting to me and always thought I walked around with it by myself, that second order cybernetics was in profoundly influenced by Matt Turaner and Varela. Although in reading a lot of stuff, it's the other way too. Heinz had a tremendous amount to do with the bringing forth of this idea, which I had no idea of till I read you, Bruce, because Heinz didn't run around doing stuff like that, saying I did something. You never knew that Heinz did anything but pull, pull flowers out of a hat. I'm joking, was such I'm joking of course, but not. Yeah, well, you he know. was a magician. I um, thought when I talked to Heinz, I always thought I knew everything because he was so happy to work with whatever you offered him. Aww. The second- the second perspective is uh, to question the question of knowledge, the body, the organism that wasn't positivistic or representational, a way of knowing. Now, I want to say something quickly. The observer makes the distinction and every description of the system is made by an observer. That was a profound impact on me, which I learned in 1971, that every description of a system is made by the observer, such, that the, oh, go ahead. such that the observer is made by the observation. I think that was what Bruce was implying. And I have a question the, about and that. And the boundary anyway. is also indicated then that the system observed will be intelligible in its self-referential reactions to the environment. That's really important. The system will be intelligible to the observer. Its interactions with the environment will be uh, intelligible to the observer. We don't really know about the system and Maturana goes, uh, Varela goes on and on that what will be important is for us to understand this capacity that we have to make a distinction, to make observations given the distinction, and that we must always know that the observations we make are built on the distinction made that closed that system. So that it's very humbling in a way uh, uh, and very beautiful in a way. Of course, the psychoanalyst to me would say, of course, one of the interesting things is uh, of the self-reference, how we ever really think we know the self. And so it goes on and on and on and on um, in a way that, you know, is always in process, always in question, always somewhat pragmatic uh, and, and, and living. So the the knowing is very much coming out of a living uh, relationship that we cut. I wanna say one more thing because I'm, I don't wanna lose my thread, which I am. Okay. Every time we cut or close, we cut in to reality. Matt Tarana was right, there is hmm. a reality. We don't know it, but we cut into it. And the history of those cuts is also part of the environment. That's how I get to technology because the observer is not always human. The most interesting ones are technological, of course. And I say, of course, and so they're measuring apparatuses and the measuring, the history of our measuring apparatuses, human beings measuring apparatuses, the history of our relationship to measuring apparatuses is also part of the environment for any cognition, thus, distributed cognition. So I'm, I'm heading for a little uh, questioning about autopoiesis and its closures. I have a question. Are, are all autopoietic self-organizing holes um, self-referential? Are all what, I'm sorry? All autopoietic as the term you seem to be using, um, which Varela didn't use very much after his experience with Maturana, are all self-organized systems self-referential? Is that a characteristics of self-organization, self-referential? Yes. Would you agree, Bruno? Yes, I'd still wanna say that what- Well, hold on a second. Because... 
the, the category I'd put them in is autopoietic systems. Me are too. Are self-referential by, okay. you know, kind of by the declaration of the theory. Uh, yes, but it's part of that self-referential helps me understand the dynamics of all living systems, just as emotioning, which is a term Maturana invented, is what all living systems have in common. Yet we humans live in languaging, which makes us somewhat different, but we're all emotioning beings. So my question is, given that you do think that both of you, that all living systems are self-referential as a component of the system itself, okay, of self-organization as a system. It's just a component, I understand that, okay? My question is, are observers more than humans? It's, okay, that's my question. <laughs> she took a ride there, didn't she? <laughs> hey, well, what did I, I do? A ride. Why don't I jump in on that first and, and serve it up to you, Patricia? I mean, so we're talking, the other term coming out of autopoietic theory is cognition. Autopoiesis is cognition. Right. Uh, and uh, so that's an, uh, a definitional identity within the theory. So it means that all living things have, have uh, the capacity to sense their environments in, 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 in some form that, uh, that, that, you know, that allows them to, gives them the best chance to maintain their autopoiesis. So we live in a, so this is the distributed cognition, I think, at least my way of getting at distributed cognition would go through the biosphere uh, mm -hmm. on the way to the technosphere. Uh, but, but that's the great, that's why this theory is just so important in our post-humanist reckonings at this moment that we live in a world that's full of observation and, and, and theoretically you can take that up to Gaia as well as a planetary observing system. I won't drag you there, but I write about that in my latest book. So I think on the biospheric side, you've got, uh, if life is cognitive, is self-observing, and, and you know, and the devil's just in the details of how these things get linked up, but mm -hmm. that they do is seems, you know, indisputable. So you do think that, that self, all self-referential systems are observing systems, is that correct? I just want clarity, that's all. Not an argument. If it's autopoetic. If it's autopoetic, that's right. Oh, okay. So you're saying that there can be systems that aren't autopoetic that are self-referential. Oh, uh, yeah, because you can apply that to, to structures, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, in other words, that propositional, in other words, the term is part of a philosophical dialect or, or, or vocabulary. Uh, um, so one can think of mathematical systems, for instance, as building self-reference in, or algorithms, right? Uh, have uh, a, a certain where where mm. the right I where, know. where the function feeds back into itself to continue the function, but that's not exactly an autopoietic system, right? Okay. But, okay. So would, is but, big data a self-referential but not autopoietic system? Maybe. Well. <laughs> I want I wanted to breathe a little bit. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I liked um, that addition. Um, uh, I was uh, calling it smart biology, but you know mm -hmm. that by, that of course that is uh, cognition um, by definition. That cognition belongs to the autopoetic system because cognition is that self-referencing. Now the question is. Uh, and I don't have the answer and Bruce already mentioned, how do you get to other um, arrangements, other measurement technologies? Because that's my interest, self-measuring more than self-referencing. Uh, how do you get to questions of technologies of measure? Is all cognition now belong to the biological? 
or do we actually have cognition that is not maybe problematically, but already have cognitions that don't belong to the biological? And therefore, what our political ethical issue is, how to recognize those. And I do consider uh, algorithmic um, architectures as one of them, that it's very condition of ongoingness is a use of the incomputable or the indeterminate, which is a word that we love. I'll go back to autopoiesis and indeterminacy in a minute. But given that I would say, of course, it's not what human beings can do, but that they're doing that, we have to figure out how to understand what they're doing and how to readjust the relationship of autopoiesis to that. Autopoiesis is a kind of closure that, as Bruce was suggesting, is theoretically rich and has lots of implications and is very useful, but it doesn't cover all of cognition and it puts human consciousness or phenomenology too central. And I believe we now, and Gaia is a good example for me too, that there are, that are other parts of the universe besides the human one that has experience, that has sensation, that responds. So we're aware of those yes. things because of poetry and because of all kinds of things, but also because of data. We have massive amounts of data that are really showing us human beings, how cognition and, and a kind of consciousness is already happening beyond the human. I mean, you know, we have Whitehead, Deleuze, all, all kinds of philosophers that also spoke to that. So how to wonder about what is human and what should be the closure of the human? That's why is the big question, philosophical, political, ethical. And that's why I loved Varela's last piece. I don't know if it's his last piece, but the piece before he died about his liver and really wondering about what it's going to mean to have different body parts moved into different bodies. And what is the difference between closure and autonomy as well? So um, there's a Bruno's book, by the way, that he edited with Mark is fantastic. I mean, I love that book, Bruno. All my students read it because there's so many rich um, developments along the lines I'm speaking of in the book that are respectful nonetheless to um, autopoiesis and second order. For, for people who are observers, which we all are, you know, it's interesting to understand what our relationship to the apparatus that we use to observe, you know. What do you mean by apparatus? We don't just observe. I mean, we have apparatus. I mean, take a um, particle and wave. We only know there's a particle and a wave because of the way we measure. But that's hmm. a huge understanding. It's an explanation, a phenomena. Yes, but we can have both, although I'm assuming we will someday have something that can do both. Yeah. But, once they figure you know, it out. So that apparatus produces that reality. And in that sense that we can never separate any reality from the apparatuses that produce it. And that's not just the human observer. It's all these profound apparatuses which the humans help make and extend. And so the technological has always been an extension of the observer observing his self in his observations. Well, that makes me, I, can I say something? <laughs> his or her. Um, I, we're in disagreement uh, on that because I have real concerns about being post-human or, or talking post-phenomenology uh, in that. Um, and, and one of my questions to you is that, uh, can one talk about uh, post-phenomenology in a pot, take a positive stance when talking about post phenomenology, because from what I've read, which is very limited, um, I don't see one. And I think that's problematic because I think it is us humans in our apparatuses that we choose that make these distinctions and descriptions that generally gen may not generate the world I wanna be a part of. Yeah, but you know, that's what that's what intimate distances Varela himself 
sort of uh, moves beyond phenomenology, although he truly loved it. I mean, you know, he's a Merleau Ponty fan and, you know, where you go with that is really interesting. And, and he has a, a, a phrase that I love, the contingencies of life that accumulate in the history of body technologies, that we're going to have to understand life in relationship to the history of body technologies. Sure, we should be extremely worried. That's the point about really looking at it and thinking well, about it. Well, I think it. also the point is generating a language for explaining it that takes a positive stance, which again, I would be very interested in knowing. And I'm not talking about- What's a positive stance mean? But it means not positivism, no, no, uh, no, no, but one that an explanation that helps generate a world or society I want to be a component of. And from what I've read, post phenomenology, I'm not talking about normal phenomenology, which I think was Varela fell for me anyway, but this idea of post human and post, you know, I think it's a negative way of viewing the consequences of big data and the technologies that come along with it. Okay, we'll, let Bruno, we'll take Bruno, let Bruno take that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, okay, part of the, the, the complexity here is, um, so when I talk about uh, post-human, I always talk about it uh, next, uh, alongside post-humanism. So post-humanism is the, is the philosophical efforts going on among, for instance, the philosophers that Patricia mentioned, or we think of them as sort of proto post humanists, post humanists, in other, in other words, it's not a jettisoning of humanism, but it's a putting humanist uh, 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 ideas of human exceptionalism and so forth, uh, you know, into moving that off center stage and putting it into relationship with the non-human um, and, and, and which can just be uh, other living things or- That would be nice. Technologies. Uh, <laughs> so those are the two sort of wings. So the post-human as a stereotype is like a cyborg is, is, is this generally uh, troubling, yeah. uh, image of a of an amalgamation of of the biological and the technological okay that yeah. and and that's the and i think big big data <laughs> that we're all worried that big data is somehow going to achieve autonomous agency over the the phenomenon out of which it emerges and and then start pushing us around like some yeah, some technospherical big oh. daddy. So if I may, uh, I mean, but to me then Varela's work as, as a part of the autopoietic discourse of second order cybernetic, it's kind of a bulwark. So here I, I might argue with Patricia just a little bit, or at least Patricia, oh, the way I, would, way I would revise or, or restate what your your point and and your your papers really the one that was distributed with with the announcement is, is you know just very lucid in in laying out you know the stakes of this argument but yeah, yes but my thought is what i see with regard to this technosphere is is this ongoing complexifying of the environment that that we're of course based we're we're most responsible for, oh, for. and that the, these are the cuts. There I, mean, you go. I, I thought that was really a fascinating statement that the cuts we make just by observing accumulate in the environment. Oh, this yeah. is a perfectly Gaian point of view, right? Yes. Now life alters its own environment, yes. not the other way around. Right. And we humans are altering it with all of this by throwing off all this technology. But where, but but I'm not ready to make the leap to to that 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 algorithms have achieved cognitive uh, autonomy, at least I mean, and maybe it's just my hope that that that's not, but where I where I put that I see that as that still, that's the hyper complex environment we've created for ourselves that we situate between 
and now I'm with apologies, I'll revert to a Lumanian vocabulary that it, it, it's, these are the media technologies that come between the psychic system, which is the domain of phenomenology, and the social system, which is the domain of communication, which would be where your explanations happen. Uh, experiences in the psychic realm or domain, explanations are in the social domain because now we're using language to, to code to code that experience yeah. in order to to share it out of our own heads. So to me, uh, we uh, I, I think I've said yeah that was I I, uh, I, I I love that refinement because it helps us not to get into what's bad and good here, but um, thank you very much. And yes, there's a little difference between us, <laughs> not, su su not such a small one, although not one that I'm sure, sure of. So it stays small. Us being humans? Uh, of course we're humans. Uh, the, well, no, us know. being, you said us, and I wanted to know what you were speaking oh, to when us, you said us. Uh, between me and Bruno. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Also maybe between me and all other humans is a possibility. Okay. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Just, I, just let which, you know, we have which I always strive for. Thank yes, you, Matthias. One sentence, and thank you, Matthias. Um, and that is no, algorithms are not um, having an autonomous cognition from us. But what I would argue, following um, someone I love reading, do you know her, Bruno Luciana Parisi? You're really I interested. Not, not this more recent work of hers. No, yeah, it's really phenomenal. It's, it's difficult and very speculative, a whiteheadian, uh, but interesting. Mm -hmm. A little different than Mark's work, who also is very interesting to me. And that is to say that the algorithm and like things has asked us to have another idea about thinking. And, and it's very interesting, the one she suggests. So not autonomous cognition, but a kind of thinking that's not biologically based. So it might be very limited. It may have all kinds of problems with it, but it really demands a, a new kind of thinking about what kind of thinking is going on in those machines and asks us to learn more about it and think more about it as the psyche and the social are implicated as you laid out so beautifully where we all live. The thinking that she suggests comes from Peirce, but Paul, you'll tell me, I think it also comes from Gordon. And it's the emphasis on abduction, not induction. And what's the other one? Deduction, but abduction. And that is a kind of thinking. And it feels so, so like BCL to me. I don't know what that means. I mean, just being around Heinz, a thinking that always creates a new problem another problem, another problem, rather than conclusions, and recognizes that the data is um, accumulating in such a way that it can draw on itself to ask another question. It, it may even- Thinking in questions is what came to my mind. Yes, or even a conversation, but internal to the apparatus itself, so. Well, I think it's internal and relational, but that's a whole nother story. We won't go there because we should open it up to the audience in regard to uh, comments and questions. And Larry Richards, are you helping us with this, I think? Uh, yes, I have a couple questions that have come to try to clarify some words that get used a lot. And they seem to get used in different ways. So Susan Ferranti, for example, has a question about the word self. And the question is, self-distinguished from what? Yeah, I don't know, Susan, do you want to add any, anything to that? Great question. Um, I'm always interested in the words not chosen. Um, so when a person says self, they decided to not use other words and thus in a certain information theory way, I understand then the choice by investigating the history of the, the, the alternatives not chosen. Mm -hmm. So those three, the self-referential, the self, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering if in each case they're um, refusing to use the same thing or 
are there different things that are avoided in order to you choose the word self? So. But what did you say that it, the last part, Susan, because um, I love the question. What did you think was getting refused? Oh, so the question is, given that those three terms that Judy laid out, Jude laid out about, I'm trying to find self-referential, et cetera, in each of those cases was the same other, other words where they, the other words that were continuously not chosen. Mm. So they, in a sense, had a reference point, a kind of a negative reference point. Yeah. Well, for me, it was a matter of starting with me, which as a cybernetician, I must do. And as a student of Herbert Brun, I must do, which is why I want to look at what I desire rather than what I don't desire. And that comes from Maturana as well. But I see self as the identity one operationally has through its coherences uh, brought forth in a moment of zero time. Yeah, I think it's a very problematic word actually. Um, and another entrance into the debates around the human right now and uh, human um, uh, privilege or human centeredness with regard to the environment, the forest, the trees, the animals. Uh, so uh, I think autopoiesis also um, sort of reduces alterity or otherness. And that's why I just threw in very quickly that when we say self-reference, the self word is very complicated of what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, just to return to the mundane, it, it, it's a word we inherit from our philosophical vocabulary. Yeah. So it, it uh, so aren't they in, all? This, in systems theory context, it's basically another word for the system. I mean, the system, right. Uh, right. The, right. It, it's for that, it, it's the whole of the whole system that is uh, imbricated in or with other wholes, but but has uh, but has that closure, right? And of the operational closure that holds it together as a as a distinct or semi-autonomous entity. And if I could throw in a, a real quick anecdote, so one of my mentors, Lynn Margulis, uh, who would call what happened to Francisco. Uh, tragically with his cancer, a, a kind of technological endosymbiosis. In other words, she would have a, a category for life is always folding in other pieces of life and seeing what, seeing what happens, hence the eukaryotic cell. But Lynn hated the uh, uh, Dawkins, what the selfish gene. She always hated that oh. form of biology. And what she would say is a gene has no self. <laughs> a gene is a molecule, a gene, so she would press on, on the, the inappropriateness of the metaphor because a molecule is a structure. Right. Uh, a molecule is not a system. The, 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 the minimal living Bonus. system is a cell. And, and so, and as an autopoietic system, that is the cell. The cell is the cell, the, uh, uh, autopoietically in that context. So the that's- other derivation that's great so i would say something else not to like it has to be on the side uh because you know there's so many good things to say they don't always go together there's something about ta time and temporality and, you know. that we haven't really addressed too much that every repetition to use deleuze's famous is a repetition with a difference so every return to the self involves temporality. So the self is, is um, it's, you know, it's complicated by its different speeds, its different uh, movements, um, something that sometimes autopoiesis takes you away from thinking, not that it has to, but uh, so the returning in the reflection, you know, the thing that bites the tail. Ah, that reflection. Yeah. It's interesting what it does. So, you know, as a psychoanalyst, I'm not sure there, there is a self either. <laughs> but, but you're right. right. There is one. It's in process. I mean, it's, it's in process. Yes. Yes. From moment yes. to moment. 
Uh, it depends on your understanding of understanding whether or not the self means one thing or another or another. Right. Yeah. Let's move on. Thank to you, another, Susan. <laughs> let's move on to another word, I think probably related, and has to use uh, do with a, uh, our, our cybernetics use of the word observer. And uh, the question, I'll read the question and, and then uh, comment and ask Robert Cutler, who asked this question, to comment himself. What is implied by the proposition that the human ocular system is an, quote, observing apparatus, unquote? In other words, the word observer, he, you know, appears to many who are not scientists in particular as something that involves eyesight. And of course, the tradition yeah. in science was to talk about the observers, you know, the scientists, Good you know, point. whatever they're doing, whether it was with their eyes or their ears or, 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 or whatever instruments they were using. Um, but I don't know, Robert, uh, would you like to clarify that a little more? <laughs> well, it's, uh, doesn't mean too much more than actually what's on its face. The context for the posing of the question was uh, the discussion of observational apparatuses, uh, for example, the wave particle experiment. And it occurred to me that um, that uh, there are corporal or incorporated uh -huh. uh, types of, uh, can you hear me all right? No. Something's humming, sorry. That must be my- No, it's there. Wait, wait, have wait, wait, wait. You have to mute yourself. Please. It's uh, all right. There, it's gone. <laughs> maybe it'll come back. Maybe I'll just ask this question: How is the word "observer" used differently in cybernetics now uh, than it might have been in science traditionally? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think what coming out of second-order cybernetics, the observer is. Uh, 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 coordinated with the the capacity for cognition, however and wherever that arises. Uh, so, um, so uh, it, it, the word itself drags along this optical connotation, but it has to be <laughs> theoretically uh, peeled away uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for for cybernetic application. That's, I mean, that'd be a rough and ready way I'd, I'd generalize the concept. Patricia? Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's more to say. I, I think that uh, uh, the human eye is often thought of the observer, but, you know, one learns fast that it's really an apparatus of sorts, right? And it, is, it made me think of the difference of biology sometimes because biology is sort of what they call, um, you know, you touch stuff and you look at stuff. If you think of physics, of course, it's always an apparatus you create and then see how it changes given what you created. I mean, it, you never really just look at the universe, let's say, or even maybe matter. So I, I think digital technology and has capacitated what we mean by measuring uh, apparatuses or um, is at the end of the history of, uh, of observation. I don't mean it's ending it, but it's at that point now. <laughs> and that's history. Is it easier to understand me now? Is the hum gone? Yes, it is. Good, good. Uh, I unplugged my microphone. I'm using the embedded microphone now. Uh, yes, the um, I think Patricia, uh, uh, moved a great distance for answering my question, which is really an open-ended, the, the context in which I posed the question or what motivated it was the um, allusion to the wave particle experiment where indeed the observational apparatus is something external to the uh, physical experimenter. Uh, yes. Doing the observing and it occurred to me that uh, these are not the only apparatuses that permit observations and that the uh, sensory systems of the uh, biological organism are also 
it could also be called uh, such uh, apparatus. I picked the eye, the ocular system, because it's the one that uh, first occurs. And, and so I just pose that as a kind of like an open-ended question, not with any uh, intention or extension. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of, you see my little, I can't see you. I wanted to see you, but I can't. Um, I also oh, think sorry. That the digital, strangely enough, has really um, elaborated from the touch, not from the eye. And you know, the um, not only is our our our, our, our technologies all now increasingly touch technologies. Um, it's a it always intrigues me that the digital that's often thought of as disembodying the human has really extended human touch much more and human sensibility than the eye. My my yeah. my thought. I just. I mean, to kind of wind it back to Varela or his, his way of expressing it, the observer would be a system that's able to operate a distinction. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Observer makes the distinction. Whatever that system might be. Yeah. Right. But so. some of the distinctions that are getting made are pretty wild. <laughs> Such as? Well, you know, what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain seems okay, but, you know, I think in the universe now we are, you know, what is, um, for instance, climate change? You know, climate change is nothing but, um, but you know, all kinds of numbers and data and that we think refers to it. It's a complete speculation. Weather, we do know what weather is. And we experience weather. That's why we connect it so often yeah. to climate change because it's experience. But we don't really experience climate change. Yeah. Not yet, anyway. Uh, Self-organization prohibits it. Mm, I'm old enough to remember when climate was defined in terms of tens and hundreds of thousands of years. That dates me a bit. True. <laughs> this, uh, there's been a back and forth on the chat about self-organization. Uh, in the uh, first Gordon Research Conference, remember Matrana uh, and Brella were both there, and uh, someone asked, I think it was Matrana, about whether <laughs> self-organization was a useful concept to him in his biology, and he said no. And uh, Milan Zelani, who was in the audience, said, oh, "Okay, you're using the word organization differently than how it was originally used. How? What about self-structuralization?" And uh, and it sort of stopped, <laughs> stopped there. But there is this, this issue of the, the principle of self-organizing system, which Ashby introduced in 1956 in his book, in which it said all systems close to information will move toward a stable state or a stable cycle. That was the principle of self-organization. Yes. In doing so, it, it enabled certain things that were not previously enabled, hence the appearance of, of, of uh, uh, resisting entropy. On the other hand, by moving there, it's given up a lot in order to get there and, and have that capability. Right. Uh, and Hello, Patricia, you can see me now. Yeah. And, that, and that's all in the, in the domain of uh, uh, sort of the machine domain or the, you know, the domain of, of, of structure right. uh, and so forth. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on, on this, but it does seem like we often move back and forth between these domains, the, the machine domain and the biological and then even the biological and the social, uh, is as though, as though it, we can do that, you know, with impunity. That is correct. That's why I don't like Lumen, for instance. But um, you know, it's been a while since I read. I was smiling while you were talking, Larry, because um, Matt Toronto was so fussy about what word anyone was allowed to use in referring to his own thinking. Very stubborn about that. We had a few fights, he and I, they were, you know, they were great and he was gracious, but he was no. <laughs> it was intentional stubbornness. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, most of the time, I think. Not always. But I think, I remember- uh, I, I'm not once. complaining about it. No, no, no. I mean, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about, you don't have to reflect on that right now. I mean, it's totally <laughs> cool. You, I don't see it as a, a illegitimate Station. I think we've lived in love this afternoon. But I, I do think there's a difference. You raised some questions about entropy, about homeostasis, 
And when anyone who's using the notion of autopoiesis wants to stay away from some of those words and emphasize something else, and it, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this is another topic. Uh, Paul, in his introduction, mentioned that Maturana and Barola diverged in their interests. And I, a couple of those divergences included that Barella, uh, you know, was very interested in formalism and, and in the formalism that whatever, you know, mathematics could provide. Mm -hmm. I, he was also interested in mysticism and in particular Buddhism mm -hmm. uh, and trying to reconcile that, you know, with, with his sort of system of thought. We have a question he, here uh, from okay. Vivi Calderero. It's, I would like to hear your thoughts about Varela's joining Buddhism in regards to his the evolution of the notion of self within his thinking slash cognitive system. Well, Bibi, would you like to add anything? Oh, thank you. N not really. I've always been intrigued about that. Um, Connection. Move, uh, about that move or that need that he felt and I've never really um, had a way of um, following that um, that pathway that he followed and I'm really intrigued by it because I think that it feeds into his thinking in very particular and interesting ways and I would like to hear those of you who met him or who have more detail about his research um, what you think about that. I did get the sense in 1986 when Grill and Matrana were together that Matrana thought these were sort of dead ends and, and so that's why he wasn't that interested in going. Yeah, so that I think that was certainly one of the separations and in my paper I do make reference to the Buddhism uh, not because I truly know um, Varela's thinking about it but I found it very interesting that someone named Timothy Morton you you must know him Bruce right Tim Morton yes who who is, writes about ecology um, that there there's this this gap I actually quote, something is there, a certain physicality whose phenomena I cannot predictably demarcate from its reality in advance. This physicality has the quality of givenness. It is just there, yet not in a way I can conceptually grasp. So it reproduces the notion that we make the reality, but there is this gap between phenomenon uh, Jude, that we produce, I'm listening, and something that's there, something that's given, a kind of givenness, that I think for Varela, I have no, not certain, but uh, that Buddhism offers something of a thought like that. What I what I remember reading about his Buddhism, which was triggered by your mentioning it in the paper, was that it had to do with his interest in selflessness. Selflessness, yeah. No self. Here we go, back to the self, selflessness. But no self isn't like nothing. It's more like this gap between phenomena and thing. And that's come yes. back. It's, it's you know, oneness. It's, it's always been there philosophically even in the West, but it come back because we're interested in the complexities of the environment. What, just what are they? And especially what are we doing to it? You know. And I, it reminds me again, Patricia, of the distinction of between that I'm making now between realism and reality. Yes, there is reality. Realism, no. Right. There's someone, Peter. Bruce, did you want to say something on this subject well, matter? I, 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 I'm backing off. I, I, I okay. really have no knowledge. In I, I have, I could speculate to some, but I, I don't think they're. Okay. My, my understanding of the notion of self in, um, in Tibetan Buddhism uh, is, to put it in uh, these terms, it is, it emerges from contingencies, it's very simply put. It's, mm -hmm. um, it emerges from contingencies and, and 
it's sort of the that there are consciousness of the five senses and and that the self is a you could be said uh, so thus I, I have heard that uh, the self is a quote unquote sixth consciousness that emerges from the contingent concat not concatenation uh, contingent um, simultaneity of mm. of those five simultaneity good word mm -hmm. I should say no more lest I fall into um, uh, <laughs> worse ways of expressing my thought. <laughs> I think Bits and Morton wants language. to say something. Larry? Peter, we're running, Peter. We're, Larry, go ahead. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, we're running a little short on time. We never did get to the topic of big data. And, well, uh, we did, sort of. Sort of, yeah. But I do have a question here uh, that's related, I think, from Seymour Hirsch. Uh, and he wants, he, he's asking, he'd be interested in uh, what our interviewees think of the prospect of a sentient AI. And I think... It, it seems, and if you could connect that to big data, that would be particularly useful. I'm not sure you can. <laughs> what is sentient? Self-conscious. I think. I don't know. Seymour, do you want to verify that? Absolutely. Self-aware. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Patricia, Bruce? Well, I, I think there's a long conversation to have here. And uh, <laughs> Next time. I, I uh, like the question of Buddhism. I don't want to make any of my descriptions worse and worse and worse. But, you know, or, <laughs> but I, I, I think that's when you feel the self thing really bothersome. So um, indeterminacy. What I heard that day in 1971 or two, whatever it was, of uh, Mataran explaining autopoiesis was there was indeterminacy in the biology that it selected, it couldn't just be imposed upon by the environment. It, it had an indeterminacy to it, not just input and output, but something going on that belongs. And the word indeterminacy is very important to politics because it's where change happens. It's where, where good thinking happens. And so there is indeterminacy in the algorithm. Does that mean anything more than filtering of input? I don't know, but I think so. <laughs> and, and I love the offer in the paper from 76 of the interview with Donna Johnson, where Varela offers the alternative to input output as in relation to triggers, perturbation, yeah. Compensation, compensation and behavior. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that paper, Bruno. Yeah, it's beautiful. Sure. There's someone really trying hard to say something, Peter Horton. Yeah. Okay. If that's very kind to let me in on this, but I wanted to refer to the Buddhism uh, angle and maybe throw a little bit of light on that. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I'm um, more interested in the Taoist, the Chinese philosophy, which is a parallel to the, the Buddhist philosophy. And I did present a very short paper at the uh, the Chapman conference on Gaia in um, uh, in Valencia in 2000 uh, on this, on the parallel between uh, Taoism and Gaia science. The parallels are very strong. And I just wanted to give you a couple of little flavorsome things on that. Um, one uh, which we opened with this, uh, this idea of reality and realism. There's a lovely Taoist phrase which says, the Tao that we can describe and talk of is not the real Tao, okay. which, <laughs> which really sums up that whole area um, of whatever <laughs> we say, however we try to describe it. We are never, ever, ever going to get into the depths of it. Um, on the self idea, uh, I think of a tree and maybe people say, well, a tree has self and the Taoists would certainly say that a tree has um, uh, a, 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 a identity and, and into, uh, into, into uh, works with its environment and so on. And then suddenly now we've got all this stuff on mycorrhiza. So is a tree the tree or the tree and the mycorrhiza or what so when you're talking about self again you know yes. we're like delving into this whole area where as humans we're judging this whole thing as though there is an answer 
and we're trying to get to that answer by defining all these terms, which are absolutely fascinating. And autopoiesis is one of my favorites. But at the end, you know, we must remember that the, the complexity and the subtlety and the depth, and I'm a Gaia man, you know, from this point of view, uh, here, we're here. never going to be able to explain. So part of us has got to stop and just enjoy being a part of this amazing process yeah, too. I, so I that, wonder, that, that's why I'm a beekeeper. I, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I want to say something that I didn't get to say, but the, the notion of autopoiesis and closure sometimes is too severe to my mind that you, one gets the picture of the, especially like a self as an individual or a, an individuated system because of the closure. And for the most part, most living things stay in relationship to Absolutely. what I would call the pre-individual, all the things that make it endlessly individuate. So while there is autopoiesis, uh, you know, spiritually speaking, and, and I want to say something about that. Um, there is some other way of understanding our un, ongoing relationship to that which we individuate from. And when I first went to BCL, um, it was uh, my theological background that used to make me think I understood what everybody was talking about, which I kind of laugh about now because I'm not sure that was true. <laughs> but there was a kind of, um, there was a kind of, possibly a kind of mystic mysticism of it. Mm -hmm. My problem with autopoiesis as a term is that how it's misused. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> I would uh, propose that uh, it may be used in different ways uh, across different socially right. constructed well, academic that's true. disciplines because the field of knowledge or the field of phenomena to which it is applied differs. I often make the analogy uh, between, with, with structuralism. And maybe some of you know um, Jean Piaget's marvelous little book on structuralism, where he ranges from mathematics to anthropology, passing through biology and uh, economics, anthropology, and so on, and says, yeah, structuralism, it's different, in, applied differently in each of these uh, fields of uh, knowledge endeavors, but that's because the phenomena that are being studied are different from one another, and yet, and yet there is something in the way that it's done that enables one to say, aha, that's structuralism. Aha, that's structuralism. I feel the same way about complexity theory and by implication about uh, some of the terms that are used. For example, uh, Pil Bona, uh, Pila and I, uh, I had a discussion once uh, exactly about what autopolysis meant. And uh, she said, oh, you're using it that way. And I said, well, yes, I <laughs> right. am. that's because yeah. I'm studying X. I'm not studying Y, you know. Right. So right. Um, I just throw that in there. you know. To, in well, I think that my problem with the explanation is that, and Varela was pretty clear about this, that people want to apply autopoiesis to groups of people and explain them. And I don't think that's a little bit legitimate move. That's where my problem is. And you know what? We need to... Yeah, look, look. Let people know. We have time, Jude. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, it's very open ended. But Angus Jenkinson asks if Varela had never lived, what would we have lost that matters most? <laughs> Wholeness. Bruno, what's that mean? Can't uh, think of it? Well, I, I, I'm trying to grapple with the question. It just seems to me he, 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 um, he arrived, he, he synthesized, uh, he laid it back out and he developed the discourse in, in, in all, you know, in, in a manifold of ways that we, mm. you know, that we've just stayed kind of more or less in the BCL earlier moment of, of, but I just think he was so inspirational I, that you can't just, you can't point to one thing. You can just say, uh, you know, this brilliant spirit gathered up 
mm -hmm. second order cybernetics moved it on uh, in, in uh, ways that are still unfolding. Yeah, I think that given, uh, you know, my own discovery uh, for this, this conversation of how much was being invented really in the early 70s, um, and given the last person's remark, whose name I'm lost already, um, Thank you. You know, he, he brought together also, and he says himself, he brought together, but he also came out of a particular political, economic, cultural moment. I mean, it would be 1973 that we look back, we once called postmodernism, now look back and call it neoliberalism, <laughs> structural adjustment. I mean, he, he was a political thinker. I think it mattered to him what had happened in Chile. Um, I think it affected both of them. Maturana came to BCL a few times after what had occurred in Chile and uh, and, and Herbert, of course, being at BCL too. So I think sometimes there's a, what Deleuze called a diagram, you know, that about the structuralism idea that across the board, something gets captured institutionally, psychologically. There was something about that concept and still is that um, sort of in, in the making and, and something changing about it. So it's, it's a great ref self-reference point. And I, I think he made a difference that perhaps Maturana didn't make. Maturana probably made some other differences. Mm -hmm. made his, he made his own differences to our thing. Yeah, he did. He had a good beginning. I used the word good. Okay, Bruno, any last comments? Oh my gosh. Thanks so much for Brief. the opportunity. <laughs> Bruce, Bruno, take your pick. Uh, this, I thought it was a wonderful conversation and I, I'm happy to have been on the hot seat uh, as, we, as we geared it up. So uh, I like Catholicity, personally speaking, when it comes to systems theories. So there are many other discussions to be had. Yes, Patricia? Well, yes, I feel the same way. I, you know, uh, as I've uh, mentioned before, I, I, I went to BCL as a wife of a husband, not really intending to learn anything and soon got sort of absorbed into the operation of BCL. And looking back, uh, and again, thanks to all of you, looking back has really given me a view of my own life and all the things that sort of unconsciously motivated it without certain realization that I had really been at a very spectacular moment in intellectual history. And so I feel very grateful and very grateful for the, the last and this one. I'm very grateful to Bruce for all the work he's done to bring Varela's work into print and into the public. Um, it's been a gift for me. And I'm sure if you don't know his book, I'm selling it. Hey. All right. Nice. Please go out it's and a, get it. It's a good book. It's a good book, <laughs> as are the others. So um, thank you, everyone. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Patricia. Yes. Thank you, Bruno. This has thank been you, a delight. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, I don't know where he is. Okay. Here. All good. There you are. Close it out, Jude. Thank you for okay. a wonderful so session. So I want to close with a comment from Humberto Maturana. Yes. Ready? Technology does nothing. Sociology does nothing. Science does nothing. It is human beings that do things. What we do, what do we do with the claims that we make about adequate actions that we can perform? I claim that the history of humanity is a history of desires. It is not the history of natural resources. It is not a history of material possibilities. It is not the history of material world that is out there. It is a history of our desires. This couldn't have been a better in relation to my desires today. And I really appreciate everyone's participation in the process. Matthias, Paul, Pele, Bruno, Patricia, and Larry, and everyone else in the process. Thank you very, very much.